Welcome to the third, I believe, episode of Politics for People Who Hate Politics. Um, we are starting late as hell on our first attempt at a live and tweet publicized show. Not only that, but Corey Massimino fails at life because he's a left libertarian communist and has had technical difficulties. But we said, oh my God, let's hurry up and get this thing going. So someday we can do a politics for people who hate politics episode four and not just get stuck on three for the rest of our goddamn lives. My guests are regulars Joe Steigerwald. Say hi, Joe. Hello. And Michelle Montalvo, who is also Hello. a regular. Um, all right, let's, oh, man. All right, good, all right. Deep breath, everyone, audience or lack thereof. Let's do this thing. Um, what kind of week do we have in libertarian land? The first thing I wanted to talk about was the, sh the shooting in Vegas. Um, I think it's two days ago now, where this weird, creepy couple shot two cops and um, a woman. And apparently they, uh, a dude with a concealed carry actually tried to take them down and heroically failed. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about the shooting? I, I'm getting kind of a Southern Poverty Law Center and other liberals are just delighted vibe from this. Um, I'm hearing that these people were supposedly at the Clive and Bundy ranch situation and then they got kicked out for being felons. Um, so it's weird. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? Um, from what I saw on Twitter, the liberals are far too overjoyed about another shooting. You know, the, the usual suspects of Marcos from The Nation and um, Eric Bowler and all those idiots. Um, you know, they're really happy that, you know, the, the whole flag, uh, what's, what's the flag called? The uh, Don't Tread on Me. The Gadsden flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really like that that's involved and, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just the same same old thing. It's another one of these shootings where, you know, just because it's happening now and we have Twitter and all this social media, it's getting blown. I mean, not to minimize the deaths and everything, but, you know, these things happen. You know, 1.8 people die every hour in the United States from homicides. So, you know, what, what does anyone actually have any good ideas on how to stop this stuff? Because you know this is what happens in a free society of three hundred million people. Well, I guess my next question, and Michelle, we can get your thoughts in a second. Is that does it matter what the motivations of the shooters were? Because we we like to obsess over this, and sometimes I mean, um, Jared Lochner, the Tucson shooting where Congresswoman Giffords got injured and a bunch of people died. Um, that was the peak of this kind of insanity where there were people, I, I'm not exaggerating to say that there were people who were literally blaming Sarah Palin for that shooting and blaming right wing rhetoric as if it was some sort of sentient creature. Um, and that shooting in particular ended up being one that was very apolitical. Lochner was totally unhinged in a very unsubtle way. Um, so to either of you, does it matter? Do you think what the motivations of people are when they do this kind of thing? Or is it just sort of a way for people to fight about stuff? It doesn't matter. I mean, why? It's, it's just another political tool for people to use. Every time one of these things happen, you know, the first thing people do is try and check out their political affiliation so that they can immediately start blaming, you know, the entire Republican Party or the entire Democrat Party. And, you know, everyone, um, maybe this is just the Twitter culture, but, you know, there can't just be a shooting because someone's, you know, insane or just, you know, lost all, you know, rational thought. It always has to go back. You know, there always has to be a reason. Now, it, it's either the mental health, you know, they weren't on drugs or they were on drugs mm -hmm. or they really like Sarah Palin or they really hated Barack Obama. I mean, there's always a reason that, you know, you can conjure out of thin air, but, you know, nothing ever comes from these reasons they find. Okay. Uh, Michelle, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'd be lying if I said I, I wasn't curious every time about the motivations behind these shootings, but for the most part, they're incoherent. Uh, 
ideologies behind these shootings and you know these people are unhinged and that's where my curiosity ends. I'm like, oh, well, that guy was clearly, like, <laughs> not in his right mind to do uh, such a thing. So, But most people want to connect these tragedies to their cause, so that's not a good enough answer for them, the, you know, not being able to connect it directly. And uh, it's her uh, shooting. Because one of my favorite things that came out of that shooting was the father of the little girl who was murdered said, I'm going to butcher his quote, but he, he came out and said, you know, if this is what living in a free society means, then I'm okay with it. And liberals went insane over that because they couldn't have him on their team um, to use the Lochner shooting um, as a anti-gun kind of prop. Yeah, that father, um, I think his name was John Green, not the YA author. Um, <laughs> His interview is like amazing because I would forgive any parent in that scenario um, who had lost their child days before for being angry and making ridiculous suggestions about, you know, the policy we needed to pass immediately. And that guy, I mean, as libertarians, we probably say we don't live in a free society, but we live in a relatively free one still. And yeah. this thing, can you stop individual bad actors from doing this kind of thing? I don't think you can. And and the fact that he agreed so soon after that tragedy continues to amaze me. And the fact that people should, more people should remember that guy because I don't know, I, I just haven't forgotten him. Oh yeah, it struck a, it struck a nerve with me, like hearing him say that, you know, after losing a child, like you just said, I, you know, anyone could forgive him for just being incredibly angry at, you know, the person who, you know, took his child's life. But yeah, yeah it was amazing. And that's, you know, usually what you see after these tragedies. It's always the, you know, the parents who want to take away all the guns or, you know, bump up, you know, government restrictions on all this stuff. They're the ones who get the sound bites. You know, I don't even think I ever heard of John Green after that shooting, mm -hmm. you know, because obviously it didn't get as much coverage as, you know, you know, they need someone to blame. If yeah, someone, it didn't give us coverage as people who were trying to pass a law in their child's name, basically. Right. I mean, yeah. People people think that you know if they can't blame something, then you know the act will go and be forgotten. You know, they need to connect it with something. You know, some piece of legislature or some kind of you know political decree. So you know, and I, I feel like they do that because you know they have to have some kind of relevance to it. It can't just be forgotten. You know, in the midst of history, there has to be something more to come out of it, and you know, it, nothing ever it can't really. Just be a tragedy. Happen. It can't just right. be an individual tragedy. It has to, it has to mean something, and that that temptation is understandable. But I mean, that's how people die all the time. That's how you know, um, that's how wars keep on because you know, you can't be the last man to die for mistakes. So let's just keep fighting until we've convinced ourselves it's not a mistake. Right. I mean, there's there's always bad laws that come out of tragedies, you know, whether it's 9-11 or, you know, the Spanish-American War or the Vietnam War. You know, that's, unfortunately, it's always ammunition for the politicians to, you know, create some new law or take away, you know, more freedom from people under the guise of, you know, protection. Mm -hmm. And I was um, talking with a friend earlier about how often these shooting, these type of shootings occur in places like Chicago or where I live, North Philadelphia, but those stories never get projected on, you know, to the news media. It's always the places that uh, aren't forgotten um, that get the most attention, the ones that aren't the, you know, the decrepit cities of America. Yeah, where I mean, one-on-one -on -one shooting is not yeah. interesting to yeah. media. Right. Um, a big, bad massacre is and it tend i mean there's a certain logic to a bunch of people killed in one place it is more interesting and in a school instead of you know a, a horrible neighborhood there's a logic to the attention that is paid but it, it at this point I, I i'm stopped feeling forgiving about that like i understand it's more dramatic when a bunch of high schoolers get mowed down by their classmate in nice suburbia in littleton or somewhere um but 
the message is still it matters more when it happened to certain people and we must legislate it away well all the time as you both have said people are dying in these other places so the media is terrible basically <laughs> um and speaking of that and speaking of your amazing lower thirds um i think we need to talk about the slender man now <laughs> Because this story is depressing and confusing. Um, basically, this started with the two girls in Wisconsin, 12 year olds, who stabbed their classmate and friend actually 19 times. Um, and she barely survived. Um, thankfully, she did survive. And the story is that they blamed the internet meme paranormal creature, the Slender Man for this in that they were killing their friend for the slender man and that's weird enough obviously and then there was another story where this woman says her child wearing a white mask and a cape attacked her for the slender man and even in the vegas shooting one story i swear i didn't hallucinate it um has a neighbor quoting that these uh, the the man it was the you know the, the Vegas shooting used to dress up as the Slender Man and we've now seen the photos where he's the Joker and she's dressed as Harley Quinn which also means they're bad people. Um, <laughs> do we have thoughts on the Slender Man and what the hell is happening here? You know, media panic, media trying to connect these probably completely random you know things to something bigger. You know, it always has to be something bigger than the actual crime and the actual people. So, you know, I'd like to see how many, you know, people were murdered in scream masks after, you know, scream came out. But I'm sure, you know, throughout history this happens. And, you know, the, with our social media and our 24 hour news cycle, you know, Slender Man's kind of a big deal because it's in vogue and like the geek culture and, you know, it's, there's all sorts of fan fiction. And, uh, but I think, I think the thing is, most people, I think the majority of people reading about the stabbing probably didn't know about the Slender Man. I did. Um, I thought he was actually, like, it was interesting because it was this collective effort to make up a myth and have it, you know, spread all over the internet. Um, it came off of Something Awful forums in 2009. And there was also this element where it was supposed to be based, based on kind of Old, way older folklore where if you you can sort of will it into existing in our world which makes it extra meta and kind of like what, what, what I mean is that I don't think people had heard of the Slender Man so maybe you know these little girls are true sociopaths and they somehow struck upon this sort of ingenious excuse for what they did but at the same time they're being tried as adults which I have kind of a problem with because they're 12 um, I don't know, like this has ruined the awesomeness of the Slender Man for me, but also the fact that it's spreading, supposedly, is just very strange. Um, it's, it was just such an ex obscure choice of excuse that I almost, you know, it's it, like, like the Scream movies were, you know, popular, Joe. Um, right. But picking the Slender Man, maybe it's just like the official sign of the internet age. <laughs> well, but, I mean... I think it's popular amongst certain groups of people, you know, the, the video game nerds or whatever, you know, people like me, I guess, who know kind of the geek culture. I think it's more popular than, you know, I think it's more popular in a different area. It's not something, you know, like you said, that most people reading these stories on CNN and whatever are going to know about, but I think there's a pretty large subsection. You know, it's, it's the nerds, it's the geeks, it's the people who usually get blamed, you know, the Columbine shooters, people like that who would kind of know this kind of internet meme. Well, the Columbine shooters, of course, were, what, what was the blame? It was Doom and Marilyn Manson, right? The right. Best. And also they were bullied, except that they weren't, they were actually bullies themselves. Mm -hmm. um, God, that, like, that reminds me, Columbine, um, there's a book that's just called Columbine, and the author is Dave, somebody, I'm blanking. His book is amazing um, because it just talks about how the media got absolutely everything wrong about the shooting in the first um, years. And like the one takeaway from any kind of, 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 of sordid crime or shooting 
I think should be that the media doesn't know shit and they're going to get a lot wrong still. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Slender Man is probably just another convenient scapegoat. I mean, the, the fact that the media has been having these headlines with, like, killer meme and, like, other things where they're acting... I mean, they can't resist, I think, is the idea. They might know that they're being sort of ridiculous, but they, they, they can't resist this kind of, of reaction to, to this strange of a story. Michelle, do you have thoughts on the Slender Man? Um, yeah. Uh, basically, everything that Joe said... Um, I, while you guys were talking, I was just thinking about, I mean, this is a little different, but I was thinking about the, uh, when Judas Priest was on trial, it, back in like 91, 92, because two kids had shot themselves, one of them died, the other one was like severely wounded from like a gun, um, was it like a, shot himself in the face with a rifle or something, and um, just kind of trying to blame everything that isn't normal to the rest of the world um, for these, you know, for these heinous acts. Um, and I remember, I didn't, I didn't realize that this, yeah, it was weird to me that the Slenderman was getting uh, this attention because I remember like logging on, like, hey, why is Slenderman in the news? This was, this is really, and I'm like, oh, that's, uh, that's not cool. Um, yeah, just media not understanding anything and not knowing how to uh, operate in the internet age. There was, my roommate and I were laughing because we saw this news story on Reddit, and this is not related at all, but um, this news story that ran on uh, a new feature in Mario Kart where Luigi, like, gives a death stare. I'm like, why is this on a news station right now? Um, it's just the media not knowing what to do with all this, like, information and trying to mold it to their own liking to make something out of it. Yeah, the, there's nothing quite as sad as the extremely mainstream media trying to talk about the internet. Like, have you guys seen this, like, like the local news be like, here's the cutest viral video that we found this week. And there's just something yeah. that doesn't work about this. Even after all these years, like they can't get a handle on the internet. You know, they don't know what something awful is. They probably half of them don't know what Reddit is. At least the really, you know, broadcast mainstream type people. And it's it's like a weird reminder that we haven't come that far. I'm I'm just afraid of some kind of you know satanic sexual abuse panic type insane story. Or again, more recently, the Columbine stuff. Anytime people start blaming culture. Um, it gets very strange and very silly, I think. I mean, if we start having, like, hundreds of these directly related back to the Slender Man, then, then maybe we can start worrying, <laughs> but then maybe he's real. <laughs> maybe he is real. If I it's think... just one, I mean, if it's three frickin' incidences in, you know, the whatever, how many years since Slender Man was created, um, five, suddenly there's this panic in the streets about... <laughs> You know, this freaking internet meme. It's ridiculous. Um, I don't hear of it. <laughs> and, and also, copycat stuff is very common. Right. It's apparently why they stopped when there was like a supposedly a, an, an influx of teenage suicides in the 80s, I think, maybe. Uh, the media actually stopped talking about it as much. And shootings, it's a problem because I, I understand that it is, there is a certain amount of news event value. I don't want to do prior restraint on the media. But copycat stuff, it really, that is real, um, that people do that. And that's part of the problem here. I'm just bummed out that an interesting modern folklore thing was kind of ruined. Or if you want to be an asshole, I suppose, say it was enhanced. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> now it's real, damn it. <laughs> oh, dear. A um, couple more. I, I, I have a lot of topics. I think we're going to skip some and maybe save some for another time. Um, we could be real democratic-like. Uh, we could talk about Virginia banning Uber. We could get right to that stupid slate piece about Which one? how. You... <laughs> 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 Take that um, slate. <laughs> I'm just. I just finally learned the difference between slate and salon because <laughs> they have the same letters and they start with the same letter. <laughs> but then I realized that. Salon was the one that 
actually had Glenn Greenwald and therefore had some merit, and now they don't. Yeah. And Slate is the other one with the, the funny meta hashtag jokes about Slate pitches. All right, we seem to be leaning towards that. Uh, do you guys do you guys read the Slate piece about how you should be deeply ashamed if you're an adult who reads um, young adult books ever? And the thing about that is that it was a slate pitch. It was a trolling, like reversal, like it's the thing, it's, it's their MO, I guess. But it was also annoying because I think as somebody who's a cultural snob in their own right and who's read High Fidelity like five times and watched it like 10 times, like I understand cultural snobbery. I want people to see me reading you know, the important books and not the dumb books. But like, it was just sort of boring. It reminded me of Harold Bloom freaking out about Harry Potter like a decade yeah. ago. <laughs> do you guys have thoughts about snobbery and books? Like, do you, do you guys read? Oh, let's open it up to this kind of, um, any, any kind of reaction you guys have. I think there's a difference between, and we all probably agree with this, between Fifty Shades of Grey and uh, I don't know, uh, I mean that's that's not young adult, oh, but no, that's the it's one. like, <laughs> and like, I don't know anything else. It, it really just depends on what you're reading. I don't know. I mean, I don't really read young adult books because I'm a, I'm a guy, so I haven't read you know the that's another debate Mars thing I guess. or Twilight or Harry Potter. I saw the movies and I liked them, mm -hmm. but I mean. It's that you already said at least it's a slate pitch. It's taking something that's popular. They knew Fault in Our Stars was coming out, and they know it's a really big young adult book. And they said, "Hey, let's take something popular and write negatively about it, so we can get a lot of Facebook shares and Twitter follows, and et cetera, et cetera." And there's literally no substance to the article. It's I and mean, it makes no sense. Some of the best books you know, written or young adult books. And there's, just because they're young adult books, there's no, you know, guarantee on quality or not quality. You know. Just like any other type of book, there's right. no guarantee of quality. Literally yeah. every other type of, you know, artistic medium ever created. So, you know, Slate pitch, hashtag. <laughs> I really got upset when Slate started using Slate pitches as a hashtag. And I was like, you know, that's our thing, to make fun of you. Well, was the argument that young adult books of today are lower in quality than the young adult books of uh, the olden days? No, it wasn't even that. I mean, arguably isn't Catcher in the Rye kind of, it, it, it's now it's for that kind of age group, you know, uh, 12 to 17 year olds, let's say. And it's like a bona fide classic of all time. Um, I don't honestly don't know Salinger's own intention for who he thought would be reading his books, but you know, I don't think it was written for 80 year olds when it was first written. Um, I, I do read young adult books sometimes, um, but like, just like when I was 12, I read, you know, big ass history books too. Um, and almost more to the point, I was kind of musing like, I'm less, if I'm watching like a lifetime movie, like for hilarity, I don't. I don't expect people to think that I think that that movie is just as good as Casablanca or um, something modern and cool that I can't think of because I'm old. But, at the, but with books, I think there's this idea that if you if you spend the time to read a whole book, you must think it's like the best book ever. You know what I mean? Like the, like trash literature, I feel like is still less accepted than than, than trash movie watching. Maybe because um, you know, mystery science theater and, and, and like things like that. And Ed Wood appreciation made it okay. But I'm not jazzed, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is a perfect um, thing to kick around, but I'm not jazzed that that is so damn popular. I read Twilight and it's fucking horrible. But, um, you know, The Hunger Games, um, the first one is the best written, the rest of them are a bit mediocre, but the plot of them, they're well worth, worth reading. They got turned into great movies. Um, their writing is not amazing, but they have a lot of interesting ideas for teenagers, a lot more interesting than Twilight. Um, so I don't know, it's just, like, I get a little snobbery. I think that if you don't go, if you don't 
push yourself and read something, you know, that's challenging ever, that might be a bad thing, but it's just, I don't know. It's not interesting, this kind of snobbery, I guess. I'm trying to train myself out of that. Like, I listen to I've listened to Taylor Swift on occasion. I don't think that she's as good as Old Crow Medicine Show. Um, sometimes I want, you know, it's just... Eh. Sometimes you want, you know, bubblegum, pop, sugar, sugary, bad TV, bad movie. You know, why can't you have bad books? You know, if, I mean, I guess it's different. Because if you... they take longer, I think, so, like, you're devoting more time to the badness, but... Right, know. but, I mean, unless you don't understand that, you know, there's a difference between Twilight and, you know, Dracula or, you know whatever the Jane Austen books are that I've read. <laughs> you guys keep picking the crappy books and you can't remember the good ones, which I find hilarious. <laughs> well, I don't read anything but Shakespeare anyway, so. You do yeah. actually love Shakespeare. I know that sounds really snobby, at audience, but he really does like Shakespeare a lot. So. Shakespeare's great, but, you know, I can also, I could read Twilight and not, you know, feel ashamed that, you know, I read both of them. You know, there's, there's no shame in reading in you know, whatever. No shame in watching bad TV. I maybe I'll watch a Lifetime movie tonight. I don't know. We'll see. As long as it's about uh, a juvenile delinquent saving the life of her friend who is suffering from Munchausen by proxy, because that's I, I only or watch... about teens getting STDs. Teen pregnancy. That's it. That's all. That's I all. Or sexing I, clear, I clearly read it read into this late piece a little too much because I just thought I don't know. I read a few because late. What is it? Published a few more on um, young adult books over the weekend. Um, but I thought one of the main issues with the first article, what or the author, one of the issues the author had was that these parents or adults that are reading these young adult novels aren't communicating to their children that like, hey, there, you know, there's this world, there's this entire world of literature outside of The Hunger Games and Twilight and um, John Green novels, like don't stop here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it, that's totally fair. That's I don't know if, but do you think it's true that they're not saying that? I don't. I don't know. I, I think I'm. I've really lucked out in terms of my um, parents providing me with awesome stuff to read. Uh, Joe can back me up on this. Yeah. And the sheer number of like, you know, we had our Newbery Award winning like books for children and stuff. Like we got we got good stuff. We had like the wrinkle in time. And... Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, and I was lucky as well with my parents, but I I I think maybe that's I don't know, less of the case now. I don't know. That's the impression I got from this late piece. I personally yeah. have no clue. I mean it, it, it could be true, but I don't trust, you know, a, a piece with this kind of um attitude expressed again the slight yeah. pitchiness of it all i mean i recall reading a lot of goosebumps and choose your own adventure books as a child <laughs> yeah that turned out just great you did it's true yeah and i, I remember also read, you know I, I read peter the great biography of 900 pages when i was 12 or whatever yeah I mean, it, it comes down to parenting just like everything else mm -hmm, it's true and and it, it's why it's obnoxious to have I mean, I, the piece was about adults doing this, but I also, I, I, miss, I always dislike the, um, the sort of, you, like, you're all adolescents, even though you're 25 and grow up type attitude. Like, we, we, we want millennials to do well in the real world, but this attitude, like, I don't know, just leave, leave millennials alone, man, and stop dissing everything childish. And, um... Yeah, I was. I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say, Joe. I remember the li the one librarian that was at our local, well, our parents' local library, um, and she used to I think judge us a little for the Goosebumps books that we would get out, but like to 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 you know to brag about my myself, like we we had the World War II history books and the Goosebumps books mixed together, and I honestly think that that's kind of ideal. Is that you do you, you have an appreciation for varied types of culture, trashy and not. And the more you have, the more variation you have in that, the more you're likely to appreciate what is good and what's good in different ways. You know, like Roger Ebert kind of got a little old near the end of his life, but he was often very solid about appreciating a movie on what it was intended to be, you know, because of its genre or what right. have you. It wasn't yeah, he, all supposed to be- He enjoyed his trashy movie. movies, his pulp movies, his mm -hmm. you know, bad movies. He, he kind of had a love for them. Actually, I mean, some of his reviews were very 
glowing in a, you know, he might have given it two stars or whatever, but he understood that, you know, this is a movie that speaks to a certain aspect of human culture that just wants to, you know, watch something explode or, you know, whatever else. And um, I think we can I think we can do that with all mediums. I think mm -hmm. books can be just the same as everything else. Yeah, I think that's a good summation of it all. Um, I think that we should probably try to be disciplined millennials, not like those slackers, and wrap things up. However, um, give me in brief, it's got to be brief, I think, what you guys have been enjoying that is not politics in the past week or so. Uh, Michelle? Uh, I've been really enjoying, well, it ended last weekend, but the show Silicon Valley, which is on HBO, and I've also been enjoying The Return of Orange is the New Black because I think it's wonderful and everyone should be watching it. Um, not only because I like, you know, conversations about Netflix and what it's doing um, as far as, like, the market is concerned and uh, streaming services, um, but also because of this is a show with, you know, pretty much a heavily female cast and amazing characters and, I think it's awesome that Laverne Cox was on the cover of uh, Time Magazine and they're talking about like the transgender issue in America. And these are just all amazing things that are coming out of this show. Um, and I'm pretty psyched about that. It's a good show. I haven't, been, I haven't watched season two because I can't afford to watch 12 hours of anything right now. Joe, what have you been enjoying? Uh, my life revolves strictly around Game of Thrones. <laughs> and every week is a living hell until 7 or 9 p.m. And then kind of um, during 9 p.m., yes, right? Yes, including 9 p.m. There's literally <laughs> no moment of my week that's enjoyable anymore. But um, in the next coming few weeks, FIFA, the most corrupt organization in the universe, has, you know, the World <laughs> Cup starting in Brazil. So I will be enjoying that. Uh, I'm rooting for Germany, as it is our motherland. And I'm, right. I'm going to say Brazil over Germany in the finals. I think I one. root for whoever isn't in Brazil, like bulldozing slum to make room for the World Cup. That's who I vote for, probably. It, it's worth it. It's worth oh, it. Oh, shut up. No, he didn't say that. Um, I have been enjoying also a lot of Game of Thrones. I've been rewatching it with my, and also Joe's mother. Um, Awkward. And it's very much more poignant the second time, like the tragic ending. I don't know about spoilers anymore. I mean, um, season one and the poignancy and... Oh, and then season before the episode before last with the battle and the and the gratuitous violence and the head crushing. It was awesome. The oh most my god! Thing I've ever seen on <laughs> I literally covered my eyes and like screamed no like six times. And my mom had to come in and be like, "Oh god, they didn't kill Tyrion, did they?" And I was like, "No, they didn't." So it's okay. <laughs> um, as a final to this experience. I'm going to give a dramatic reading of every single thing that Corey Massimino has typed um, during this podcast. Because, oh, beautiful. Uh, all right. From the beginning. Corey Massimino, 615. Yeah, yourself, 60 seconds. That's okay. Don't acknowledge me. It will be funny. Tell the viewers I said they suck. I did a school report on that trial. I read Fifty Shades when I was 12. You fucking sexist. Tell Joe I said fuck him and fuck the patriarchy. Um, 6 through 9 p.m. Good. Casablanca sucks. There's a lack of libertarianism in this section. Some would say fuck the state. If Hitler read Goosebumps, World War II never would have happened. Quote, Roger Ebert got old towards the end of his life. <laughs> Lucy Steigerwald 2014. Let it out, Lucy. Installing my webcam, which is a great final comment. Oh my god. Um, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. All right, do you guys have any final words of promotion and good, what do you got for me to wrap things up? Anything? I've, I'm just sitting back. I'm letting, I'm letting this happen, whatever's happening. Fuck the state. Oh, stop it. You're a minarchist at best. Uh, Michelle, words? What are you, what, what, anything? What are you up to these days? Anything libertarian like? Just living the dream? I've been uh, I've been live streaming the World Barista Championship in Italy. So that's my life. <laughs> that's Outstanding. Now. Very good. I like that. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we're going to wrap it up for the evening. And episode four, I think hopefully we'll, we'll do that soon and get Corey to fix his goddamn technology. Um, 
As usual, you can read my things in Anti-War and Rare and Vice and the Stag Blog, and um, you should do that. Thanks for joining me, Joe and Michelle. Um, You're welcome. Corey, you suck at technology. Thank you, audience of two, which was had a height of three at one point. Oh, there it is again. Three viewers. All right. Thank you for joining us this evening, and we will see you again for episode four of Politics for People Who Hate Politics. Bye, guys.